Welcome to the Future Generations Podcast, providing you with the world-changing content necessary to inspire you, your family, and our planet to a life of optimal health potential. We'll help you make the choices that powerfully influence the lives you bring into this world. It's time to strengthen our resolve to do better now and for our future generations with your host, Dr. Stanton Hom. The man, the myth. Oh my goodness. The legend. What is happening, sir? How are you, man? I'm great. How are you? Great. How are you? <clears throat> I'm doing well. I'm doing really well. I think I'm I've sorry. shared with you more than most uh, of, what, of what we've been through, but honestly, turn a corner, man. I'm super great. So glad I'm to be here. Oh, so glad. So glad. And I like it's fun when you know the whole, you know, the mission, when you know what's going on, you know, kind of the whole program you know how everything rolls so i don't have to explain all that so we just get to start diving in to the man that is dr stanton huh and and that's what's going to be so freaking rad man so we'll uh we'll chat for a little bit and then we'll just open it up to our our young men and and uh just have a good conversation man but i just want to start by thanking you for not just being here man but thanking you for for who you are it's always an honor when i get to bring Anybody that we get to bring in on the show is, I mean, that's an honor. It's an honor to have that time and to get that wisdom, right? When it's somebody who is also a dear friend and a brother, um, that's another, that's another step up, you know? So thank you. Thank you for that. Truly. I will say, I feel, um, I feel little butterflies, you know, I, I've spoken to sometimes 10,000 people live and I've spoken on four continents and, and honestly, I would consider this time that I'm with you guys uh, one of the most important times that I've ever felt like I just I, I feel so one honored to be here. But but secondarily, I just feel like um, the words become to matter so much more when I get to speak into what we call the future generations. I, I, I love I love the fact that um, we're on the same mission, my friend. Very honored. Oh, no. Honor is, honor is completely on this side, man. So I'm excited to dive in and, and tell the world about what's going on. That's that's one of the, the cool things about this, too, is, you know, we want to inspire these amazing young men that we have here, and, and they are the future generation. And we've got, you know, these guys are already leaders far better than a lot of the, the grown men that you and I deal with. Uh, you know, I mean, that's just a reality of it, right? Like these these young men are, are amazing leaders, but um, I'm excited to get the word out about you too and just what you're doing i want this you know i love that this goes out to 100,000 people every episode too i want people to know who you are and what you're up to man so but we're going to dive into all that but since we have some young men here and um, we got you know young men that that listen i like to start with stanton as the young man i like wow. to start with stanton when he's you know when he's 15 i know when i was 15 i had it all figured out man i knew everything at 15 now that I'm 43, I realize I'm an idiot, but I knew at 15, I knew everything. So uh, did you know everything like I did at 15? Uh, I wasn't anywhere near as cool as the young men on this call. Um, but who were you at 15? You know, 13, 14? 15, uh, I mean, I, 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 I would say that I was the, the coolest nerd in the world. No, at least in my world, right? Yeah. I was, I was um, at that time... I don't know, sophomore, junior, I, I graduated at 17. So I guess that would make me a sophomore. Mm. And I was, uh, I was, I was a band nerd. I am a, I'm a brass player, awesome. played the trumpet, played the baritone. I played the tuba. Uh, and I was a varsity tennis player at the time. And so I, I had two things uh, going against me in terms of like the high school popularity contest. But I had one thing really going for me, which was my brother who uh, I had just benefited from going to school with for a year because he was a senior when I was a freshman. He was like, he was like state champ water polo swimmer in okay. Southern California. That's pretty much like legendary. And yeah. so I was also the second smallest kid in school. So I had three things kind of stacked against me to some degree where the, the only person smaller than me was a little person. And um, so I, I but I crushed everybody. I went, I went undefeated my freshman year in high school when I was a small, I, I looked like I was 10 years old and I was beating, you know, kind of grown teen yeah. teen boys. And then by the time I was a sophomore, I, I had, I had a little bit of a, 
street cred from my brother and i was i was a little bit more of a swag because i was really tiny but destroying people on the tennis court so so i think on one end i was frightfully um socially anxious to some degree and on the other end i just i kind of had a, a a deep confidence in in what i was capable of that's awesome man oh that's <laughs> so, rad. so tell and so tell us about the relationship with the parents too solid everything solid at home at home, I would say, uh, I don't know, very, very traditional Asian American. My mom's side okay. is a little bit more um, uh, traditional. She emigrated from Taiwan in the 60s. So we still have a lot of tribal kind of that typical tiger mom type yep. philosophy coming from her. And then my dad's side, he was born in LA, uh, but he's from his family's from China. And so largely, um, um, totally assimilated yeah. and, and my dad was one of the most, uh, laid back dudes cause his dad was world war II, uh, just kicked his ass a few times. Yeah. And so right. my dad, my dad kind of promised that he would never do that. And so it's interesting, you know, cause, cause I was pretty much maybe more, um, proactively raised by my mom and still to this degree, um, but I would say relationship was always good. Um, relationship was always based on fear from yep. my mom's side. And then my dad was always the one that I just knew uh, there was a certain like inherent unconditional love. And then, you know, kind of a quiet type of leadership to that degree, but overall good, um, but very Asian American where there's, there's not a lot of words sometimes. There's a lot of, a lot of modeling. Uh, for sure. A lot of a lot of guilt, yeah. To some degree, <laughs> yeah, Anyways, I, yeah. But I understand, and I—I I mean, I truly I understand that. You know, and I grew up. Um, obviously, didn't grow up in an Asian American household, but I had a lot of <laughs> friends who were growing up in an Asian American household. I have a lot of you know, and so I saw that. And another thing that I saw in that was there was an inherent pressure for a lot of them. I don't know if that's yeah. something you experienced too, right? There was a pressure to perform there was a pressure to be elite at anything and everything and by the way anything and everything kind of meant what they wanted you to be elite at there was an expectation on um you have three dude, what do you mean you, of course you have options of what you want to do when you grow up right like you're a <laughs> doctor you're a lawyer an engineer like are you thinking there's something else right like there was that was that part of that for you too was that pressure there it, it was it was unspoken yeah, uh, but it was the fourth. There was a fourth option, and it, and it was your failure, right? And so, mm. your doctor, a lawyer, engineer, or a failure, mm. and 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 you could choose any of those, right? And so we did worse, right? We did. My brother and I did worse in that we became chiropractors, you know, because then you're just the the doctor that doesn't actually have a degree. No, I'm just kidding. It's but so it's, it's it's societally like totally unacceptable until you get to 2020. Yeah. And you realize that, oh, we're, oh, we're, oh, 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 we're right. Okay. So oh, anyways, we could get to that. Oh, oh we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. So, so, uh, so then let's talk about that decision to become the chiropractor. Like, what did that, what did that look like? How did you even come to that? Cause I do want to get, I want to do as much, you know, anything that you want to dive into, yeah. but I want to do kind of go high level on where you got yeah. to what you're doing now. And I really want to dive into what you're doing now, what you stand for, how that all looks. I want these guys to hear that. So how'd you so, get that? So let, let's, let's, let's keep going on that timeline that we were on before, because yeah. by the time I was 17, right, that summer, uh, my summer uh, after high school graduation, I was um, maybe two weeks after high school graduation, I was in the mud, uh, low crawling at basic training at West Point. Mm. And so, so that, that is, uh, uh, maybe how far I, I, I might be holding the record, like the record of how far an Asian American mom can coerce their child to go like sign up for West Point, um, go through all the testing, go through the congressional recommendations, go down that entire path, um, hate virtually every day of the yeah. first two years of it and uh still go on to graduate right and so so it i would say that it was in hindsight one of the more traumatic more than more crazy one of the more like definitely not what i wanted to do with my life mm. but definitely in hindsight one of the things that has has largely fueled everything that i do today where i 
thought that I knew that I was going to go to UCLA and I thought that I knew that I would, you know, somehow have some sort of, you know, tennis opportunity there, which I would not have. Um, and against my own wanting and my own desires and everything that I felt like inside of me was being, I, I chose to stay and, 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 and complete the, not just educational requirements, but the, the largely, I would say, um, if there's one thing, which I have a lot of things, I have a lot of issues with the academies today, but if there's one thing that I would say that the academies do well is that from the age of 17, I have always strived to live a life of significant purpose. Mm. And, and, and it's just one of those standards that my mom always held for me. And mm. then it was, it was launched into a avenue that demanded that of me. And so to <laughs> fast forward that, right. Cause then you're in, I'm in the army in 2000. I deploy in Iraq in 2003 I get out of the army in 2005 and I'm 26 years old. So about a decade older than, than the young men listening to this, um, listening to this episode. And I had four chronic illnesses. Like I had four diagnosable chronic illnesses that are still somewhat part of my VA, you know, program and disability right now. But um, I had no answers. I had no answers from the conventional medical system. My brother had uh, two years under his belt as a practicing chiropractor here in San Diego. And my only um, kind of knowing after that, that history was I'm going to move to San Diego. That's all I knew. I was going to yeah. move to San Diego. I saw my brother go to UCSD. I saw him have a virtually polar opposite experience during that phase of life um, that than I did. Sure. And, but at the same time, it was these, like, it was like, whoa, like the grass is greener and it too many extents was a lot yeah. greener yeah. on the beaches of San Diego. So I took the next, I got out in May, 2005. I took the next I want to say eight months and I grew my hair to there. I surfed three to four times a day. We lived across the street from what then wasn't a tyrannical organization of, of whole foods. Um, I, I started to meditate. I started to do like very regular yoga. I changed the way that I trained um, resistance training and in like six months, my brother was like, dude, I think you're the healthiest patient that I have. And I basically did everything that he taught me. And the one thing that it did for me that most people don't get to hear, but I think it'll be valuable because, because, because boys have a unique, even, even radically connected and purpose-driven boys today have a unique presentation in the world where I had a difficult time reading back then. I had a difficult time writing and, and I was even asked by my how I got into English for AP um, is beyond me, but I did. And my my teacher, Mr. Holmes, who I will never forget this conversation, he goes, you know, Stan, like, I don't recommend you take the AP class, AP test. I was like, I don't want to take it. He's like, yeah, it's probably a good idea because you, um, you know, English is your second language and it's, oh. Oh. it's really hard, you know? Oh. And I was like, and I was like, Mr. Holmes, I, I agree with everything that you said, but English is my only language. <laughs> so, so, so like the, the, the face on this man who was oh. arguably the most decorated teacher in my high school, but that kind of experience through English class was my experience until I, I started getting adjusted and I started yeah. to take care of myself. And I took an English class because I needed one prerequisite to go to chiropractic school um, and I aced it and I didn't even know I was acing it at the time. And, and then the teacher at the end was like, dude, I think you're like one of the most prolific writers that I've ever, um, I've ever wow. uh, gotten to teach. And I was like, say that again. And, and it was this moment in time where I, I, I didn't recognize, I did recognize that the gut issues were healing. I did recognize that my mental health and my resilience in my mind was getting better. I did recognize that my chronic pain and chronic chest patterns were getting better, but I didn't know that I was learning. I didn't know that my brain was working better. And so today, um, everything that I do is geared towards helping 
our future generations express more of their inborn um, radically resilient, but also genius level potential that um, most of us have never been taught. That is how we are designed. That is how we're designed. That is the factory setting. Yeah. Gosh, man, I love it. So, I mean, I hope you guys are hearing this, right? He's talking about, you know, we talk about holistic medicine, right? And, and treating the whole person and all those kinds of, no, you're actually treating the whole person. Yeah. Um, in, in far more, I would argue far more ways than most people come out as, you know, as an MD and you have to specialize and you follow the status quo and you, so do you still get pushback? Do you still get pushback from mom and dad, like on the chiropractor side, do you get pushback or is it more from a societal thing? Like, how, how do I think, you, I, I think, um, chiropractors like me are, are, are kind of bred to, know that we're the black sheep of the black sheep of the black sheep and yeah. so there's pushback because we're so against the great i would i would argue that if i got more and more um amplified that i would even get pushback maybe in this crowd or in other you know like crowds sure. that are that are more about our you know maybe paradigm right sure. a paradigm is whether it's abundance mindset whether it's prosperity thinking where it's possibility thinking whether it's um you know, that closed fixed mindset versus, um, I forget the other, the other term for it, but it's just like recognizing there's possibility. I, I would say that I would get pushed back anywhere, but from my parents, I would say not when it's regard to their health. Yeah. Not when it's regard to my health. Yeah. Um, not with regard to anything COVID yep. related. Yeah. Um, but I think just genera generationally with my kids, like I will get into pushback with my parents. Just like, wait, are you going to, are you going to send them to a doctor? I'm like, um, I would send them to myself, but right. so yes and no, no, I'm not going to go to Rady Children's Hospital. No, I'm not going to go to a right. pediatrician for them. Um, although we have a handful of times because I know when to and when not to. Yeah. Um, so there is some pushback there societally not from those who are open-minded. Yeah. It, it, it is, it will always come down to the fact that most people, and this is not my data, the data pre COVID post COVID of trust in the medical system yeah. has, has plummeted a third and no research, no researchers were talking about how low the trust was before. Yes. And so, so because the trust has dropped so much, there are still people who are open yeah, and there are still people who are very closed in a sense that this is a sinking ship. I am going to stay on this sinking ship because that's the sinking ship that I know. Yeah. And that's the only one that I trust. That's the one that I'm indoctrinated and believe in those who are open, whether they're wearing all the masks, whether they've taken all the shots, whether they've done all the things, if they're open, it's night and day. Like yeah. there's no pushback because it's just logic. Right. Yeah. After a while. Yeah. Game changer. Wow. Okay. So, you know, just for, for context, for all the listeners, yep. for you guys here. So Dr. Hom has gone on to build, you know, a very successful business in chiropractic and, uh, you know, as a, as a husband and a father, but COVID and you've mentioned COVID, right. That shifted a whole lot of things and you got very very vocal about that Talk to yeah us about that. so so you know i i'll i'll talk to you about it through the lens of um how do i say this i spoke at a chiropractic conference about a year ago and it's it's one of the organizations that i subscribe to i believe in everything that they that they put out there um foundationally and i was asked if i would speak at the member gathering and, the, and i said no because i wasn't traveling at the time you know my life a year ago mm -hmm. and you know what journey i've been on and i said i'm not traveling and i'm not speaking in person for a long time because of how the wake of you know so much has affected my family and 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 me and then at the same time just moving the family and moving the business 30 miles is like starting life over yep and I, I said, I will speak virtually. They said, you will be the only virtual speaker. No. And I said, okay, but that's, that's the only way that I will speak. And then at some point, I don't know why I, I said this, but I said, I, I'm going to speak virtually 
because you guys need to hear what I have to say. And this is practicing chiropractors who practice similar to me. And they actually accepted my invitation. I was the only virtual speaker. I was introduced by an amazing chiropractor in Florida, arguably one of my mentors, but we, we graduated at the same time, but he's just been one of the, one of the best at integrating into the medical system. Then he has more relationships with pediatricians and obstetricians than any chiropractor that I know right now. But he introduced me as having, um, he's like, if, if, if you all feel that anger, that anger that you have inside as a practicing chiropractor, this doc embodies that more than anyone, you know? And, and I was just like, whoa, that's an interesting introduction. Mm. And so I, I started my talk out because if you follow me on social media, if you've known that I've been deplatformed two times um, and you, you see some of my posts, you may interpret that as anger. You may interpret that as maybe um, whatever, violence, you know, inflammatory. And I have two, two things about that. Number one is I'm taking uh, conversations that I've had behind my four walls, uh, mostly with mothers, and just putting that on social media. Mm -hmm. like the frustrations that they have with a conventional medical system, the frustrations they've had with pharmaceutical drugs, the, con the, the frustrations they've had with um, laws, you know, largely that may have made you move from California to North Carolina. Um, all these things that are affecting our kids, especially those who <laughs> subscribe to public and private school, right? Which obviously your um, movement to help empower parents is such a key factor. So one is I'm just taking these conversations that if it's angry, it's because it's the anger of, of mothers and parents that has been completely dismissed by society, right? Mm -hmm. The other side of the coin is, is, is this is, this is my MO right here. Mm. Expect miracles. Right. And, and, and I actually don't come from a place of anger. It may be interpreted. It may be received. It may be perceived as anger and frustration, but it is um, from a radical deep place of love. Mm. And that love is not just for my children. Although my children being born was the most radical visceral tangible and intangible evidence of the miracle that you kids are don't let anyone tell you that you are not birthed bred and born from a miracle that is is far more vast than you could ever know and so um when covid hit um at first i was just sharing stories because i just didn't know what my voice was and then at some point, I, I met with uh, a couple of chiropractors from Kansas, and they had done a Freedom Revival event. They had some 600 people there, and they're people I graduated with, people I'm inspired by, and they said, tag, you're it. You got to do that. You got to do that for your community, and we're going to hold you accountable. And they said, when do you want to do it? I said, this day. And they're like, yeah, that's about six weeks. You could pull it off. And we expected to have... And this is in the wake of Newsom, right? Newsom at the time was, hey, you guys have to stay home after 10 o'clock. You know, hey, you know, COVID exists at between five and six feet walking into a restaurant, but at three to four feet while you're seated, it doesn't exist anymore. So just, you know, walk in on your knees or something, right? It, 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 <laughs> it, was, it was in the wake of these kind of um, contradictions and illogical whatever, right? And... And so we wanted to have some people get together. Mm. I wanted to have an event and we invited Del Big Tree. We invited, you know, some of the great, you know, influencers at the time, Melissa, Melissa Floyd and a lot of the, I you know, know, kind of, and, and Lee Dundas, we had them live, right? We had them live in um, San Diego and we expected to have a couple hundred people. It took us forever to find a venue. We found a venue owned by a Russian and he's just like, so uh, what are you guys going to have here? Are you guys going to have like a whole kind of Bill Gates is trying to take over the world type thing? I was like, dude, do you want to speak, dude? Like, do you want to speak, dude? <laughs> and so, so we ended up being the first live event that fueled three years of live events from this one particular venue because they just knew it was a compound. It was an old TV station and we just found it. We ended up having 808 tickets sold, 1,100 people, standing room only. Judy Mikovits and other kind of influencers were ah. in our crowd. They were not speaking. They were in our seats. 
because people were so starving for human connection. The first thing we did was have people hug. The first thing that we did was, you know, kind of call people out in a sense that there were a lot of text messages and, and emails saying, Hey, Newsom just called the curfew. Are you guys still having the event? And I said, Newsom called the curfew. That's exactly why we're having the event. Like you, like the logic, you, you have to realize that the more they press, the more we're going to do it. And then after that event, uh, some of the speakers, Alex Zek, Tommy John, uh, Lee, were just like, hey, in the lead up, Nurse Erin was there. She was one of our speakers. And she just, they're just like, hey, we learned more from like our initial interview with you. Like, why aren't you speaking out more? And I was like, I don't even know what social media is. Like, I hate social media. I do not like month nine for Apogee Man, right? That whole concept of your personal brand, rewind me three years ago. And I had no... I had no concept of what a platform was, but that year, let's go just before that. I, it was my daughter's birthday, right? August, 2020 was my daughter's first birthday. And that event was December, 2020. But in August, 2020, I had, we just were like, we're going to have, we're going to have a party and we're going to throw a big party and we're going to have a blast because we're going to celebrate my kid's first year life because I have been transformed because of this young, beautiful lady girl that has become the the princess of my life. And I saw something, Matt, that I, I think you would find valuable and you young men, you will too, because I posted a picture as my, my daughter sitting in my lap. This has since been deplatformed. If you go back to my Facebook, you can see the memory. And I remember going back to that. I wanted to go back because I don't have my first two Instagram accounts, but those were all forwarded to Facebook. So I still have the the record of those posts. I wrote this long caption that said, Hey, we celebrated my kid. We took over the pool. We, you know, we didn't pay attention to any of the signs. All the neighbors were like, what the heck is going on? And nobody, nobody one has the balls or ovaries to come up to you to say something. Right. And I write this long caption and, um, a young boys whose mom and him were at the party, but his dad, cause they're a split family wasn't at the party. Doesn't agree with what we are, you know, representing. And I wrote that post and he wrote a really long caption that I might share with you when I find that, that screen, that screen, um, that screen capture. But this like fueled everything for me for the next three years. Right. Because it was just like, yeah, but you're celebrating your kid, but how many people are going to die because you are making this decision, blah, blah, like, and then I screen captured it because I know this guy, I've known him for his, I actually, his son is older than my daughter. So I, and I saw their family through his wife's pregnancy. I adjusted his son and you'd never believe what happened. I was going to reply to it and it deleted so he deleted it. Mm. So this is this is really important because you guys are living in a world where tech is, yeah. it's just inherent to your world more than us old dudes on the call, right? That he thinks that comment is gone. I never said that. Where I have visible evidence of that comment and it gave me a pulse, Matt, yep. of the consciousness of men not only was this dude not on the in the arena with his son at our party celebrating life like we would fighting for freedom like we would but he was publicly putting it down directing it at me and then he deleted it right and so it's like this world where where not only are we just not stepping up Mm. not only do we not understand the gravity of what's happening today but in times of it, maybe we could say he's a, he has enough he has enough you know testosterone in his body to say what he thinks, despite how contradictory to what the world actually needs today. But his deleting of that was mm-hmm. was 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 one of the litmus tests for me that said I will never ever quiet my voice, and it's something that I realized and I made a post early on that got to platform, and I said we are at a state of the world. Where two people behind this thing Mm. could hate it, 
could never want to put on it, not believe in it, but see, be so socially afraid to say something that they will stay obedient and they will just keep going, right? They'll just keep the narrative going. And so from those two incidences, like uh, by 20, by 2021, I was, I was deplatformed by, by 20, by March, 2021, we had a heart of freedom Two. heart of freedom. One is our event. Heart of freedom. One was uh 12, 12, 2020, 1100 people there. Heart of freedom. Two was March 21 by March, by April 21, I was deplatformed once by summer 21, I was deplatformed again. And then by December 21, we had Heart of Freedom 3 in Liberty Station, an outdoor event. Um, we wanted to take our event to the public. We had Bobby Kennedy, we had Del Big Tree, we had Kevin Jenkins. We had some of the best um, of the best speakers. And we had 1,800 people. Mm. And we said that we're, we're, we're taking back our territory because it's our territory, right? Not, not theirs, not the tyrants. And um, we've never looked back, man. And so that's, in a nutshell, that's, that's like up until the end of 2021. That's freaking fantastic. And so, and you got the pod. So gentlemen, here's what I want you to do. I do want you guys, I have a couple more questions, but I want you guys, if you guys start hearing some stuff, go ahead and start putting the hands up um, and I'll start bringing you guys in here in just a second as well. Um, so is that when you decided to start the podcast? Was it right around then? As no, well? the podcast started, the podcast started in early 2020. Okay. It started before the events okay. because I just didn't know what what the landscape was going to be like. I didn't know um, what they were going to try to do with our offices, and and I I learned very quickly that there was a lot of bark and not a, not a lot of bite, and um, so we just ended up being able to do both. Awesome, yeah. You guys highly recommend, highly recommend uh, checking out that podcast. Truly, um, and I don't you know, I don't always. Do I almost rarely do that, um, but highly recommend checking that checking that podcast out. He does a phenomenal job, phenomenal guests, phenomenal conversations. Um, before I get these young men, what's your pulse on where things are now? And when I say where things are, I know that's a big esoteric concept. Um, you know, we can take it from a does does you know do does COVID 47 come in and we've got to deal with this? Like, is there, are we, are we in this lull where something else is going to, you know, kind of, kind of break? Are we being pushed from a different part? Are we in a, in the clear kind of what's your yeah. pulse on things right now? Societally? I, th I think the things that will be ubiquitous is that there will be a COVID 47, right? There will be an annual COVID fear, right? They're talking about the restrictions coming back September, October. They will start to push it just like they push flu season. They will continue the the mandates, especially those tied towards public and private school to continue to remove exemptions to continue that process because that's just the, the nature of the beast, right? The nature of the beast is let's keep that fear going and let's create as much pharma dependency as possible to the end of time. Maybe that's a little bit too too forward, but that's just what I know. I, I know that for a fact. There is no thing in the system that helps you leave the system, right? And that's healthcare, but that's also education. That's also technology. There's nothing in the system that helps you exit the system and there's no prevention in the system. And so because of that, it is lockstep if we're only looking at healthcare, I believe that they will you know, they're starting the RSV thing. They're starting all the different um, viruses, vectors to make us potentially take on more and more shots, right? Sorry, guys, if that's a little bit too forward, but that's just how oh, things go, right? How, how, how far do you want me to go, Matt? I mean, I would say that um, the Hawaii fires are, are an indicator of what they're willing to do. And I know there is, maybe that's, maybe that's controversial in itself that, that it isn't um, just wildfires, but a lot of the research that I've been showing, and this is something that I want you guys to know that before it used to be a really simple kind of uh, bromide, a little, uh, an adage where it's like, follow the money, yeah. right? Who's, who's making money, right? And then it became very quickly follow the control. Yeah. Who's going to be in power, right? 
But one thing that they're showing their cards on consistently, consistently is follow the censorship, follow mm. the deplatforming, mm. who they are flagging, who they are fact checking, who they are, you know, who the system is fact checking essentially is giving you an idea of the unacceptable narrative that is often not perfectly, it's not always perfect, but it's usually a a avenue down the path of the deeper truth that they're trying to keep away from you. And so I have a couple of interviews that are coming up that are talking specifically about the Lahaina fires and you would, you would be shocked and awed. Like it's, it is wild, Matt. And this is maybe a little bit too much for this um, podcast, but the, 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 it's not even arson and it's not even wildfires. What's being censored, what's being censored, is this whole concept of a direct energy weapon, right? And that might be too much for you guys, and I apologize, but just kind of peek in the curtain a little bit is that there's, there's, there is power being wielded to the point where, you know, what was it last year, right? And Matt, did you see the reports about how last year they were talking when that Maui was going to be the, one of the first smart islands? Smarts. Yep. And that Lahaina, Lahaina was going to be one of the model cities where they were going to build an infrastructure where if you haven't heard of 15 minute cities yet, you guys should look that up. It's not, it's not hidden. Um, they are smart cities. They are completely wired. They're completely surveilled. And um, in many respects, you may not be able to leave them, but these lands were essentially owned by generations and generations of native people. And they had no way of, of, of selling this land or getting these people to sell this land. And so, you know, potentially, right, the hypotheses and my friends that are getting the platform right now are the ones that are putting out there that this was potentially very much calculated. And it's heartbreaking, right? I don't want you guys to think that this is like a heart, you know, there's no hope for the future. What I want you to know is that everything that you're learning today is the mental, physical, spiritual um, ammunition that you will need to meet the challenge because the solution is not going to come from me. Yes. The solution is going to come from Matt. The solution is going to come from you guys recognizing that there is this level of darkness that is potentially wielding its power in the world and your light and your miraculous nature and your deep inspiration and purpose is going to fuel a lot of the, the answers. And, and I, I, I wish it would be a mission that would that I would outlive, but I don't know that's, I don't know that that's the case. Sorry if that was too far, Matt, but not too far at all. Well said, it needs to be said. That's the reality of it, right? Is, is this is not, no, there is no hopeless situation, but let's not uh, fool ourselves into thinking that there's not a, a, a battle. And that's really, you know, when, when, when I'm saying, you know, kind of what's your pulse, I don't even think it's a, is there a battle on the horizon? It's a, what are the what are the immediate battles? What is the big war? Right, like what are the? It's it's that because I don't think we're avoiding a battle. It's what front do you want to be on? That's right, right, right. Because yep. not all of us can be Tim Kennedy, mm-hmm. right? Not all of us can be Matt Bodro. Not all of us can be me, right? I am not going to be a frontline warrior in this. I'm going to be I'm going to be one of the healthcare providers that are going to continue. Which which if I was back in the military days, I was I was a field artilleryman. You know, it was combat arms. Um, but now I'm kind of a service support intelligence type person and, and I'm, I'm, I'm fulfilled every day with that role. And there's going to need that infrastructure that helps us win um, in the long run because we will win. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, but it's a matter of when we continue to um, lace up our boots and step onto the field. Right? We appreciate you joining us for this episode of the Future Generations podcast. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes and Spotify. For more resources based on today's episode, as well as more ways to inspire a brighter future for you and your family, visit us at thefuturegen.com. That's all available exclusively on thefuturegen.com.